I guess maybe I should take this time instead of uh, beating myself up over my heart condition. I can't dive too much into the hip hop or I can't dive too much into the industry that I feel I'm not fully fit for. Learning and developing my electronic sound, but I was obviously in the industry with the big the big dogs, you know, yeah. French and and Travis and Diddy. <laughs> Diplo honestly just freaking like he's he's always looking. So to anybody that's you know that needs to be listened, if they feel like they need to be heard, go to Diplo. He will hear you. <laughs> He'll hear you. They had already made the deal with Usain Bolt. They said, hey, you know, we make a record for your country. Uh, just you know, say a couple things on the song and uh, Jimmy Kimmel TV performance request or offer. And I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. This is like, you're, you're probably asking me for an approval to play the song or something. Like, you're yeah. not asking me to perform. Hi, this is Lauren Engel. I'm here with Ricky Remedy. Uh, what's up? What's up? <laughs> so you're of like Cuban descent, right? Were your parents like born there? Or? Uh, well, my dad was born in Cuba. My mom was raised in Miami, which is, I guess you could say basically is Cuba. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, like we, we uh, grew very much um, like just up on just whole Cuban, just salsa culture and, and all that. And then, uh, yeah, I mean, we're... I guess you can say I'm, I'm Cuban American. <laughs> Did your parents meet in Miami? Yes, that's actually uh, a funny story. Like, I mean, they, they met in Miami in a club. Uh, <laughs> uh, of course, dance music, you know, it's oh, like all full circle. Yeah, you know? it is. <laughs> so, um, yeah, no, they met in Miami and um, yeah. they, uh, they got together and it was just a small, it was like a small story just where they, they all knew each other because Miami's a big but small city at the same time. They yeah. all knew each other's friends and brothers and sisters, but they never knew, they never knew each other. <laughs> and then it all just it came full circle. And then was it soon after that you moved to West Palm, or like when was that? Um, well, yeah, I was in uh, I was in West Palm pretty much, pretty much all my life since I was like two years old. Um, I just, uh, you know, it's a it's a it's a more chill place. It's a little it's a little less hectic than Miami. I mean, that's just how I am. Like same with LA. Like it's like just so it's too much. So like I guess my parents uh, they wanted to keep me out of the hecticness and my dad had a job in Palm Beach so uh, it's it's like Miami but not not too crazy. What were they doing back then? Uh, well my mom uh, she was a stay at home because uh, my brother he had cerebral palsy so she had to really like stay home and take care of him mm. and make sure that he was you know good and everything was fine. But my dad was actually he was a a software engineer for uh, for plane engines, and oh, airplane wow. engines. So he was always on a computer, and uh, it's it's it was fortunate for me because <laughs> he was such a nerd, he was such a yeah. geek. So I was able to like kind of just live off of you know how how he was and with his way of doing things. And he was a tech a tech geek before tech was really a huge thing. You yeah. Know? So it, it definitely gave me a head start. How do you describe yourself back then growing up? Um, I was uh, I was an all-around like artsy person, but also like I said, very techy too. So it, it definitely fell in the right place, you know, um, for as far as music. But um, I always, you know, I walked around with a camera. Yeah, you, you also know. did like graphic design yeah, and stuff, right? Yeah, design, like all that. Like I was just, I loved, you know, just any form of art. I remember there was a point. I think I was like. 14 years old and I wanted to develop artists. I was making graphics for them. I was doing the music videos for them. I was doing... Was this more hip-hop back then for you? This was, yeah, definitely more geared to hip-hop. I mean, I wanted to I wanted to do some more dance, but I, I felt it was too complex and I didn't understand the industry as much. So I was like, you know, let me let me get with some, some local rappers and kind of see how I could develop them in a way just yeah. off of my own art and off yeah. of what I'm doing. Did you have like a heart condition when you were younger? Uh, yeah, no, it, it actually was what, uh, it's really what helped me focus more on, like, just my craft and myself, because I, um, I wasn't able to be in school for the last, uh, two years, and so it kind of held me back, it discouraged me, it made me feel like, you know, I'm gonna have to, I'm held back, and I have to do so much more yeah. on the academic side, so it just, it made me feel like, you know, I guess maybe I should take this time instead of uh, beating myself up over my heart condition, over something mm. I can't really control. So then I just continue to pursue music, 
and it was it it was this like 15 or I was yeah I was maybe um yeah I was maybe like 14 15 16 years old and just those yeah last two years of high school it was a little it was just really hard for me to to get through luckily it's it's pretty subsided now and oh, honestly good. I tell people health is wealth I love Be, that. don't take it don't take it for granted ever yeah were you into school though um not really I mean I kind of was just for the fact that um you know I was able to interact with other people and like kind of show in a way like you know whatever art I had or whatever projects or anything that I had I was able to show people um but you know like I was in a yearbook I was in a yearbook class and they were I was like the top guy because I was there late at night on Photoshop doing oh. stuff for them. So I mean I was into school but in a different way than other people were. What did your parents play in the house when you were growing up? Oh man it was actually perfect because my mom and dad like they, they didn't really want me to listen to too much hip-hop music they just pretty much played their Latin music and and obviously just dance music. Yeah. That's all they played because well really Miami that's just that's just really what's pumping out there and just the, the whole dance like communities they're very it's very strong out there and um i just i was always into the dance stuff but i wasn't the person to listen to it but um but then it reached a point i think maybe when i was 15 or 16 years old my dad started playing me some dance cds that were a little i guess you can say from like the 2000s they're a little more like new but still old mm -hmm. And I was very captured by it, and I was yeah, like, it was? I, I wish I can. Obviously, yeah. Daru, the Sandstorm song, yeah. like that, that, like, did I show you that? that blo yeah, that blows He's everybody's so mind. Yeah, <laughs> everybody, you know, when you hear that, you're like, damn, this is like, this is energy, you know, and like, there was something about it. I was like, I don't, I can't quite put my finger on it, but I feel like I'm, go I feel like I'm going to be involved with this at some point. What well, do you remember the first like record you bought? Um. I can't really remember. I think it was probably a rap CD. I think it was. Yeah. I think it was probably Young Jeezy. Uh, I think it was TM103. I think so. Yeah, it was a rap, and and that's what's also funny about my household is um, my brother. He didn't listen to too much dance music. Kind of listened to a bit of, like just a bit of everything. Um, he uh, would listen to rap instrumentals. He wouldn't listen to rap music. He would listen to the beats. And I always ask them, how, how, where are these coming from? Where are these beats coming from? Or like, how, how are you getting these versions of the songs? And he would just, you know, said, dude, show me. And I loved it. And I was like, I'm going to start doing this. I'm going to start making <laughs> beats like this. This is so freaking cool. So it was like a, a bit of, it was just my family, actually. They really helped me, you know, get into what I do just kind of by accident. It's like, yeah. it's really strange. Like, they, they don't realize it, but they will. <laughs> <laughs> And then how did you meet the like local musicians when you were 16 initially? Well, it was like, luckily around that time, you know, there was MySpace and oh. there was, there was, social media wasn't as booming as it is now. But um, I was able, because I was young, I wasn't really able to go network the same way other people are. You know, they go to mm. clubs or they go to yeah. shows or, you know, they just go out really late or they do obviously what older people would do. So I just went on MySpace and I would you know, just hit people up and be like, listen, I have music or I have graphics. If you need anything, let me know. And um, there's just a few just smaller guys that gave me a shot. And then eventually just through the local scene, like, organically grew. People started to hear about me. Yeah. And then just like that, you know, uh, there, there was uh, this one kid um, that he was connected with Lil Wayne's camp. And he was out of my city, and he's like, "Listen, I I just hear all you know all the stuff you're doing for these local guys. You, you should be working with the bigger dudes." So from there on, like I just through connections and just through working, they finally uh, brought me up to to bigger hip hop guys. So they were just like making a lot of beats at that time. Yeah, it was strictly yeah. I was just really trying to do what I felt like was um what rang more to me because I could I could have made any you know as a producer you have you can do anything you want, but. I feel like you should really just work on what you gravitate towards more because then it's more organic and people will gravitate towards more. And that's why eventually when I felt I had made my mark in hip hop or I'd done what I've done yeah. in hip hop, I was like, let me, let me expand my sound. And that's when electronic music yeah. came into the play. And when you started working with like Travis Scott and French Montana, was that before the whole EDM? Um, was it was kind of a, it was in a weird place, actually. Like, I felt 
that when I was doing that, I was like, I can't, I can't dive too much into the hip hop or I can't dive too much into the industry that I feel I'm not fully fit for. Um, what about it that you felt you couldn't really fit? Um, it's just because I felt I could do more than just hip-hop beats. Oh. I felt like I could expand more as a producer, as an artist. I felt like I, sh I should do more. So mm -hmm. it was in a very strange place where I was learning and developing my electronic sound, but I was obviously in the industry with the big the big dogs, you know, yeah. French and, and Travis and Diddy how, and all these guys. How did you meet guys. them initially? Um, well, it was through a lot of just, you know, your typical hip hop, like networking. It's, it, it, it's, it's tough out there, you know, for, for younger producers because they really have to put themselves out there and kind of like spend night after night after night, sometimes standing outside of a studio or, or waiting outside of a club, oh, wow. you know, just so that you can get in contact with some of these people. It's, it's the nitty gritty for sure. Like I can tell you, like it's, it, if you really want it, if you really want to work with people, they're going to see it. You know, so meeting those people, it was, it's a different way every time. Sometimes it's word of mouth, sometimes you, you know, someone else introduces you, but most of the time it's, you just have to really like put yourself yeah. where they are. What age was it when you started like getting to know and work with them? Um, probably maybe the age of 18 and 19. That's when so I, cool. Yeah, <laughs> it was, it was a very fortunate time because I was still very, I was very young and dumb. And uh, it, it, it was, it gave me a chance to be creative, but also learn at the same time. Uh, because, you know, everybody uh, that comes into this industry feels like they need to, they, they, they need to uh, define themselves right away. But sometimes you, it takes time to develop. So I think it was good that I was young doing all this because now I apply all the times when I was younger to what I do now. And yeah. it really helps bring, you know, just, I guess, a, a defined path for me. Yeah. Was, like, Ricky Remedy your first moniker, or were you going by something else before? Uh, I was, I mean, I was always, I've always been Remedy. Yeah. Um, I, I'd say, I guess, <laughs> I did have one name. It's pretty stupid. It was no. DJ Fresh Boy. <laughs> I mean, I know there's a DJ Fresh out there, but DJ Fresh Boy. <laughs> and it's because I was always, like, you know... <laughs> fresh haircuts and like clean clothes and I was when I was like you know I was just a young kid whatever. yeah and then um but yeah why the remedy part well it's actually funny people like I, I just got asked this question last night and weirdly enough it started out my initials are RMD oh and so I read it's like it. nightmare yeah exactly so <laughs> I, and I was like I'm trying to I need to make an email and I was like all right well I'll remedy RMDY is gonna be nobody you know that this, people are probably gonna have that so I was like well let me just add Ricky my first name and then Remedy and I was like oh wow like that actually really sounds cool so it started out as an email just for me to send beats to people and then yeah. people just kept calling me Remedy Remedy yo Remedy and I'm like dude I like this 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 name really like when I hear it it sounds like a, just a name yeah so uh and then eventually like I started to look more into it and I'm like that kind of represents like who I am as a person. I like I like to be of help in any way. That's just naturally how I am. I'm sure there there are plenty of people that can relate, but it's like they at, at any point I feel that someone who deserves help like they, they I got to be there to give it to them. Yeah. You know? No matter what, no matter how big or small, you know, it's that's, I, I got to be the remedy. <laughs> <laughs> and was your first thing, like, in the EDM scene, was that opening for Porter in 2013? Oh, honestly, I think that was the greatest, still to, to me, like, that was one of the greatest, like, steps for me to ever take in my entire career because not only was a, it's, it's a blessing because it was actually in front of, I think it was, like, 2,500 people for my oh, first wow. show. And it... It was a blessing for me to know that I'm able to expand and I see a result out of it and it's not a negative one. Um, you, because some people are scared, they feel like, you know, I, I was scared when I was making hip hop and I'm with all the biggest guys, I'm like, do I really wanna give this up? Do I really wanna stop working with these big guys so that I can pursue something that I just really love to do? And so eventually I, uh, yeah, I took the leap, I, I like, you know, I just dropped everything and I said, all right, I'm going to take two years to just rebrand myself. And and then I just started connecting with people. I connected with Paul, uh, Paul Campbell. Shout out to him for giving me my first show. 
um, and he was just a huge fan of the music, and that's that's where it draws back to like if you have good music, you know, it, it's gonna stand out. You know? And and if you have a fan, imagine a fan. You, your fan is like the a booking, a talent booker for Ultra or something like that. That's the goal, you know. Make good music, and yeah. you'll have fans, big or small. You know, it might be the person that that gives you your opportunity. At this point, were you like still living with your parents, or were you like making enough to like live on your own? Um, well, no. I mean, I was definitely still living with my parents, but it's a little bit of a mixture of like taking care of my mom as well. Mm. So it was uh, it was a little bit of both, and just me trying to make sure that what I am doing is taking me to the path where I can live what I'm doing what I'm doing. You know, yeah. I have I don't want to just you know keep doing it and I'm like I'm still making the same amount to where I like I can't take care of myself but um yeah around that time I was I was with my parents it was I mean shoot it's, it wasn't until probably just a few months ago that I wasn't with my mom anymore I mean yeah. shoot it's not don't be ashamed to to stay with your parents you know like if you really want like if they support what you're doing and you're able to do it like you know that's a blessing yeah. you know? and that's that's I'm glad I have my parents yeah for that. I guess they didn't pressure you to go to college then they did yeah. they did but um but at the end of the day they they saw it in me they saw not only like because talent is one thing but if you don't have the ambition or if you don't have the not the smarts but if you don't have uh, the drive it, it, it that it's, it's wasted talent you won't really get anywhere and people are not really going to uh, give you a chance so when they saw that people were giving me chances because of my drive and my ambition they're like all right we'll give you another year and then yeah. that year passed they're like we'll give you another year <laughs> year passed we'll give you another year so it's like it was always in their head like all right if freaky doesn't do well got to go to college but mm -hmm. luckily I you know just worked hard worked hard <laughs> yeah what happened after the Porter thing that you were able to get your name more and more out there um well after that it was just I felt well since since this is already rolling since that was a success I feel like I can't stop there so I was just figuring like I was just sort of comparing myself to a lot of the bigger guys that like I was inspired by yeah. in a good way who are they um Definitely Floss, Floss mm -hmm. like shout out to them. They actually yeah. also gave me a huge, a huge opportunity yeah. as well. Uh, definitely DJ Snake, Bro Safari. Um, I mean, the list goes on for like, you know, Nightmare obviously, around, but like around that time, it was just, it was like Floss and R.O. Grime and a lot of the like trap dudes. Mm. So um, yeah, it was, I remember around that time, uh, I was trying to uh, get a team together and like I was, I, you know, I'm just some young kid out of West Palm Beach. Nobody, like EDM is still, it was still very new and fresh. So everybody was like, Ricky, I thought you were doing hip hop. <laughs> so I'm like, no, man, like this, this, this is the thing. This is, uh, this is so much more fun. This is really like what I feel is the right thing. And, and then my friends and I, my current management who, you know, they're also my friends. We got together and we just, we kept pushing and kept pushing the brand and we kept emailing people. I hit up uh, Floss and I hit up Diplo and then just like that. Yeah, once how did the again, Diplo... I mean, it's Diplo, <laughs> Diplo, honestly, just freaking like he's, he's always looking. So to anybody that's, you know, that needs to be listened, if they feel like they need to be heard, go to Diplo. He will hear you. <laughs> he'll hear you out and he'll find a place for you. He'll find a lane for you because that's what it was, is that I saw Diplo was, was, he was very responsive, same with Floss, they were very responsive to a lot of the younger and upcoming producers. So it, it made me feel like, okay, I guess, I guess this is my chance to show my quality work. And yeah. just like that, you know, like I've, like I've said, probably a million times already, if your music is good, it'll show, it'll show, it'll show. So I guess, yeah, from there, I mean, Diplo just loved the music. He said, "Keep pumping out records, and we'll see if we can like get some stuff over on Mad Decent." And then just like that, um, freaking, I sent him I think like six records, and he picked up three of them. And he's wow. like, "Dude, like, yeah, you're, we're we're definitely gonna go." Yeah. So then um, he also just liked the fact that uh, I was a Florida boy. He's from Florida. Oh. So um, so he's yeah. like, "Yo, I'm doing uh, my my block parties, my Mad Decent block parties, and uh, I make a stop in um." Fort Lauderdale and so I'm like dude like we got to make that happen I gotta get on that like I have to you know and this is 
this is before, you know, when he had the big guys. He had, like, people like Flume on there, and, like, he had Dylan Francis, and he had, like, all the bigger dudes. So I'm like, why would he put a little remedy on that? And mm -hmm. sure enough, the music is yeah. good enough, <laughs> and he... He had me on there, so huge shout out to Tiplo. Like, yeah. Like, he's, he's definitely looking out. And when was it that you, you did a song with Usain Bolt? Oh, yeah, yeah. Honestly, I think that was probably one of the most surreal experiences of, like, being a producer. Because sometimes people don't feel like they, they really, uh, they, they work so hard. Like, producers feel like they work so hard and they don't really get anything out of it. And I was at that point. I feel like I was like working and working and working and working. And this is actually around the time I was releasing my first EP with Matt Beeson. Oh. So I was working and working and I just felt like I got to finish the EP and I got to finish this. I got to do that. And then um, one of Diplo, one of Diplo's homies, um, who is also a great friend of mine now, um, his name is Marcel Montano. And he's from Trinidad. He, does, he makes soca music, also kind of stuff, a Caribbean kind of vibe. Mm -hmm. Super dope. And he said, listen, like, we have you in mind for this song. Like, we can't think of anybody else. We need you to write this song for us. And I'm like, I mean, I got to finish the CP. I got to get this done. I can't. So then um, my manager's like, Ricky, I think you should just bite the bullet. Just go. And he flew me out to Jamaica for free. <laughs> I didn't have to pay for anything. Oh, my god! Flew me out to a studio in Jamaica. It's at G-Jam. It was freaking paradise. It was amazing. I'm like, dude, like, what is... <laughs> How, do you, how did you take me out of my mental state of being like overwhelmed and then just all of a sudden I'm just like back in like producer heaven. Like yeah. I'm in a studio <laughs> that's like right on the beach. So oh then um, he explained that this is for the Olympics. This, this is a, a going to be for a and song. He had no idea before. I didn't know. He's like, he just kind of wanted, he didn't want to overwhelm me with anything. So he said, just come out to Jamaica, we'll make something happen. And oh my gosh. So they, they had already made the deal with Usain Bolt. They said, hey, you know, we make a record for your country. Uh, just, you know, say a couple things on the song and just like that, you know. And, and it was amazing because I just completely forgot about any wrongs and anything, like any stress. And I was taken to a whole new place just to write yeah. music. Were you were you with him in the studio or was it just uh, like on no? I was I was, we were with him for a very short time, and, but it was but he was uh, he was with Marshall for a good amount of time. They performed the song together. They made a music video and all that. But I think just the experience of being involved with him, you know, an Olympian and like around that time too, and being in his country, you know, it made me really feel just involved. It's it's a great feeling, you know, being with other cultures and doing that. I think that was just. Amazing. And then when was it that you performed with Jim on Jimmy Kimmel? Oh yeah, well, Jimmy Kimmel, I think that was that was about a year ago, maybe a little less than a year ago, and yeah. it's still fresh. I'm still feeling it. I'm still taking it in. <laughs> um, what was your reaction when you found out? Well, it was um, it was I was already I was already very surprised with where that record that I was performing. Thank you very much. Uh, that record, like I didn't ex really expect it to have as much growth as it did um already knowing that yeah the song is good it comes from a great place but um when it comes to you know if a song takes too long to come out i feel like it kind of just loses it's it's like it's like uh life it's life it's force mm -hmm. um but then uh steve put it out and just over time it just like really started growing i got got all types of tags all types of people and then um we got an email maybe about a week after the music video came out saying uh, Jimmy Kimmel TV performance request or offer. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. This is like, you're, you're probably asking me for an approval to play the song or something. Like, you're yeah. not asking me to perform. And just right in there in the, uh, in the email, it just said, you know, Ricky got chosen. You know, we, they chose, I think, out of nine songs on the EP. They chose two songs. It was Thank You Very Much and uh, I think it was Lit T-Pain. So it made me feel really like, it, it was an amazing moment for me because I was like, you know, you have nine songs to choose from. I felt like there was a lot of other songs that were, that were great. They were I think, fire. So the fact that it, they, they chose mine made me feel like, like they, there's something in that song. There's, a, there's some type of, uh, 
I guess you can say, entity with that song that yeah. makes that makes people like Jimmy Kimmel want me to perform with them. I'm like <laughs> that's so crazy. And and it was a it was a very fast process. It was like maybe like two or three weeks, just like that. Boom, I'm on I'm on TV. <laughs> but it was amazing because I usually um, I don't I won't perform just a song. And, yeah. you know, I'm so used to DJing for a whole hour straight of a bunch of songs. But um, yeah, we sat. You know, we did maybe a couple rehearsals and. Just piece by piece, we like just made, we played the song live. You know, everybody had their time and then Sonny was rapping and it was just a great experience because it's not only uh, my first time on television like that, but it's also my first time like interacting with my own music the way I was. You know, I wasn't just performing, you know, and mixing it. I was, I was really actually playing it, you know, so it was, it was something very new and very fun to yeah. do. And then you also had the Latin like Grammy nomination. Oh right? yeah, yeah, that was um that was an amazing. Also, I, I just love being a producer because every situation is so different. I was um this was actually a while back. This is when I was doing a lot of hip hop stuff too. Maybe back in I think 2012. Um, there's this uh, Brazilian singer. His name is Naldo Benny, and he doesn't speak a lick of English at all, but his management obviously does. So they reached out to me and my old partner, and they said, "Hey, um, you know, we hear because we were doing a couple dance remixes just for just for you know experiments." And he said, "We heard your dance remixes; they're really cool. Um, can you make us something like this?" And so they sent over a demo that was like just a him on his iPhone, like <laughs> little hums. It was hilarious. And I'm like, we can't make a song out of this. And like, they're like, just try, just try. Like, like if, if you can't do it, it's fine. So then I'm like, okay, whatever. So set some speakers up, <laughs> made, a, made a cool little idea, a little demo. So then he flew out from, from Brazil, came to Miami. We went and like, he comes and meets us and he's obviously speaking Portuguese and his, <laughs> his manager is doing a lot of the, the translating. And the, the, the manager was being completely honest. He's like, listen, I, I don't know how to really translate a lot of the music terms and the terminology of all that. So, I mean, you, if, if there's a problem at all, like I'll try my best. And so <laughs> it was amazing because I don't think we really needed him at all because we were just so in vibe with the music and he was just kind of pointing at the screen and kind of just like <laughs> making the noises that it was like music itself is a universal language. So we wrapped up the record within two days and um, they said, listen, uh, just so that we can make it a crossover, we're going to get Fat Joe on the record. So mm -hmm. they got Fat Joe on there. Three days later, we shot the video. And I was like, cool, this is a cool like little experience. Like I was like working with somebody that's, you know, doesn't speak any English. Mm -hmm. It's um it was like a Brazilian style drum kind of style music. So it was out of out of what I would normally do, because I was also doing just hip hop, like very yeah. mainly hip hop. So it was it helped me as as a person to know that you gotta expand no matter what, you might be put in a situation. And then they, t they told us, maybe I think four or five months later, hey, we got nominated for this Latin <laughs> Grammy. And it was amongst many, many other, like, yeah. you know, other artists. So it, it kind of got lost in the sauce. But just the fact that, you know, the, the Latin Grammys, like, hurt, you know, they really yeah, appreciated the huge. song. I was like, wow. Like, <laughs> I mean, I was so young at the time that, you know, I think I was, like, still 18 that I was like, yeah, I was. It, it didn't hit me as much. I look yeah. back and I'm like, wow, like that. That's a huge accomplishment. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I'm happy that that happened. How do you think your music has changed since the early songs you made? Um, I think uh, obviously for me, and for all the produ for a lot of other producers, they've seen sonic, a sonic development. I, I think. My music is going to always have emotion. It's always going to be hard. Like people are like, yo, like, are you going to ever stop making trap? Or are you ever going to stop, you know, making hip hop? And I'm never, ever going to stop making anything. I'm always going to be making the stuff I love. But I feel like my music is always going to sonically adapt to where music is. Because, I mean, I can't say my music right now is any better than it was three years ago because I'll hear something from three years ago and I'm like, this is awesome. Mm -hmm. And some, something that I felt was irrelevant or wouldn't work three years ago, I hear it now. I'm like, this would work perfect now. You know, so I feel like music 
I think it's very subjective and I think for some people they feel like I might have grown and some people may feel like I haven't. So I think it's very subjective. I think for me personally, my music just sonically gets sounding cooler, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> really. What would you say have been your biggest challenges so far? Um, I think my biggest challenge is doing a lot of what I do independently. There, I don't do, I, I have not signed to anybody. I think the mm -hmm. only thing, the only thing I'm signed to is an agency at Circle Talent. Shout out to them. <laughs> Something exclusive, you know, I mean, like, we're, we're all dope. Like, we've been working for so long, so it's just a, a great business relationship. But it's tough to do a lot of things independently because you have to fund yourself. Mm -hmm. You have to do a lot of the business planning yourself. Obviously, you know, you have your management and you have your agency that they're going to they're gonna facilitate some of those things for you. But it, as an artist, if you're not, if you don't have a huge team like a huge corporate team behind you you're going to be doing a whole lot of just the groundwork a lot of the footwork and that's something that me as a person I'm like a very do-it-yourself type of person so I feel that the challenges I face are that just being DIY all the time and, and having to find ways to make money extra money or you know having to stay up extra hours just so that you can send those emails out you know if you have a whole team you know, if you're with a record label, you, you can go to sleep and go to the studio the next day and you just got to worry about making music. But I also feel like those challenges, that's what makes me more wholesome as not only, you know, an artist, but as a human. Because if you want anything, you got to work for it. And eventually it reaches a point to where if you have people, so many people working for you and, and giving you and their, their version of your vision they're, you're gonna you're gonna lose yourself and you're gonna lose you know because I've seen people that were a huge inspiration to me and they felt like they weren't doing the thing they really love to do mm -hmm. because of their position with the industry so it may be a challenge but it's also it, it definitely it's more worth it to me as a person yeah you know everybody's different every producer is different every big artist they can sign every artist they can stay independent it's yeah. all gonna be different how do you think you've grown as a person I think as a person, um, uh, that's tough because we're always, you know, on an up and down path, you know, no matter what. It's always a roller coaster. But I think me the mental health is uh, is always something you should be self aware about, and I think mm -hmm. that's something that I have been a, a much more aware of. I've been more uh, just finding ways to, you know, not find escapes to to things so it's like you know eat healthy you know get your exercise get a decent amount of sleep as much as people are like you know as much as i'm saying you know you have to stay up some nights you know <laughs> also remember hey take yeah. some naps you know if you feel your stress or jittery you know take a break maybe not drink coffee all the time have some fruit have something nice you know yeah everybody has their thing but uh, but but as a person i think uh Having self-awareness for your mental health is number one. Last question. What do you want to be remembered for? Oh, man. That's a, that's a heavy question. <laughs> um, I definitely just... That's really tough. I just want to be remembered for um, everything that I've learned because I love to teach it. Mm. Um, I, I, want, I, want peop I, want it, I just want people to... Um, feed off of a lot of both the good and bad things that that I have done and learned mm -hmm. so I feel like I think my biggest thing is I just want to inspire I just want to inspire a producer and if I die tomorrow or if I'm gone you know they're able there's somebody that is moving off of my legacy that I didn't even give to them or it's mm -hmm. just something that I I I was doing my thing, I was teaching, maybe somebody asks me a simple producer question and that was the one thing that fixed everything for them. So I think the one thing I just want to be remembered for is the help that I gave. Just um, that inspiration and just that extra bit of fuel. Yeah. Because I've had so many of those moments. <laughs> That's great. Thank you so much. That no, was thank awesome. Thank you so much. <laughs>